Good morning. All those of you that are out there, and welcome to worship at Lindsay United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here this morning. This is a beautiful fall morning, isn't it? Nice and cool. We got some water. Things are looking up. And if you're listening on the radio, if you're uh, streaming live on Facebook, we thank you for joining us this morning. We have a few announcements in the back of your uh, bulletin. If you pick one up, uh, you can see uh, there are people we want to keep in our prayers. There are some birthdays. Um, the third is today is Bobby Pendergrass's. And Nancy Pratt's got a birthday today. You want to... <laughs> and Tom Herron's is tomorrow so if you see Tom tell him happy birthday Diane Powell has one tomorrow Bobby Stevens has one on the 9th is Fred Abelis's the 10th is Mike Beckman's the 11th is Francis's Francis Bunch and Aubrey Rickey's birthday and the 12th is Mike Thomas's birthday and the 14th is Kevin Motes on and on till the next week now, we're going to have men's breakfast next Sunday, right? That's okay. Um, we have a stove and we have a cook. Yeah. So this will be a new experience. So you guys show up. we got stuff to talk about. Men's breakfast, 8 o'clock next week. Uh, some anniversaries. On the 1st was Randy and Diane Powell's anniversary, and the 17th is Marlon and Anita Butcher's, and the 18th is Tommy and Kira Davis's. And on Friday, October 8th, that's this coming Friday, uh, we are going to feed the football team, and Barbara is in need of brownies. So if you want to volunteer to make brownies and bring them, you can make them at church because the stove works, if you want. Uh, oh, you want? Okay. So uh, if you can... What? You can make them on Thursday and bring them. So if you can provide those, let Barbara know. On the 22nd, it's not in your bulletin here, but on the 22nd of October, uh, we will be feeding the band. Details to be announced. As I understand. Any other announcements? Yeah, just quickly, I uh, want to thank all, you all again, those of you who stayed last Sunday for the pre-charge conference, church conference, and then today at 2.30 is our annual charge conference, which will be with our area cluster of other local United Methodist Church, but it will be done by Zoom. Uh, you see that information on the back at uh, 2.30 this afternoon, and the links to the Zoom meeting can be found on Facebook and should be able to be uh, found on our uh, church website as well. And hope that uh, a few, as many as possible, could be there today to participate in the life of worship uh, and churches around us and then in the life of our church as we formalize the business that we accomplished last Sunday. Okay. We've got a new baby Texan, in case anybody wants to know. Uh, Calvin Elliott Jean was born to Allison and Cameron Jean um, one day last week, the 28th. Way to go, Grandpa. <laughs> whatever, whatever day of the week that was, it was the 28th. And so uh, Mama and Baby and Daddy are doing fine, and Grandma's there with them, and the other Grandma was there when I left yesterday, so he is in good hands. Nine pounds, three ounces. Yeah, he's already wearing one-year-old clothes. <laughs> Maybe not, but probably could. We are here to worship. Let us stand together and sing, Here I Am to Worship.
morning. I'm glad to be here this morning. I've missed the last few Sundays and I've missed you and I hope that you all are glad to be here too. Join me in the call to worship, please, from Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven by God. Praise be to our God. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgotten by God. Praise be to our God of mercy. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all those who are righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart, mind, and spirit. All right, we're going to do the same song we did last week that's in a different tune. The words are on 560, but it's to uh, the church's one foundation. Scripture for today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 32, verses 1 through 7. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. May God add a blessing to the hearing and understanding of this holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Jeb, we were always delighted when you're back in your home church here to be with us. Yeah, you, Shelby has two home churches. She has her summer home church in Marlowe and then her back at school home church here in Lindsay. And we're always glad when you're back in our home church to bring your gifts and graces with us. Before we get started on my second sermon in a forgiveness series, it's important to remember that in just a bit we will be serving uh, and sharing uh, communion together. And communion is that special holy meal in which we as Methodists believe that more than just remembering what Christ did for us a long time ago, that somehow the Spirit of the living Christ participates with us in communion as a means to grace. That somehow the Spirit of Christ is with us and when we consume those elements of, of bread and, and juice, that the Spirit is with us in a special way. And one thing that's part of our liturgy, and we'll see this a little bit later on, is that before communion, and it is, it is given to us as much as part of the ritual as anything, is the confession, the confession of sin. I talked a bit about it, this a bit last week. To confess our sins before we receive communion. And today, as we are talking about forgiveness, I would ask you to give special thought to where in your lives you might be carrying some sense or load of unforgiveness, something that perhaps during reflection time before communion today, those are things that you could offer up to the Lord to begin to work on and then give yourself over to the means of grace that is communion. So last week I began with my first sermon in my series on forgiveness that will take us through uh, into the first part of November. And I made this statement about forgiveness. I challenged you with this statement and that talking about that we can't easily forgive and forget. In fact, I challenge you to think of it this way that we should forgive, but there are good reasons, good reasons not to forget. But we should remember, and when we remember what it is that we have to forgive, that we do that through a lens of grace rather than through the carried, unresolved anger and hurt that we can carry for years and years and years. So not forgive and forget, but forgive and remember. But when we forgive and remember, we do so, we remember in ways that are beneficial to our well-being. I'm going to read a statement to you. This comes from a, uh, a psychology blog. It says this, Forgiving is critical. Forgiving is critical to our emotional health. We can learn from our past experiences. Forgiving can strengthen our relationships. And then forgiveness allows us to safeguard ourselves from being a victim to the same offense again. So this author is talking about forgiving in a way that remembering helps protect us, that forgiving with remembrance allows us to safeguard ourselves from being a victim to the same kind of offense again. So last week I ended the sermon with a statement about forgiving and forgetting. This one it says, Forgiveness is how we live in peace. Forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. That forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we should not forget. So I mentioned that there was a story behind that. So here's the story. At a previous church years ago, I was providing pastoral care to an older gentleman. He was in his mid-90s. He was a retired physician. As I got to know him, as we got to know each other, as I was visiting him in his home, when we could do that safely in those days, he began hinting at really terrible abuse that he had suffered at the hands of his parents. He was raised in a Native American family in great poverty, and that anger and frustration was carried out on the children. The abuse was severe, and he had carried the wounds of that child abuse for 90 years. Late into one of our conversations, as he was struggling with forgiveness, he had not been able to forget that abuse. He had carried those memories for 90 years. He had no hope of ever forgetting what happened. Forgiveness seemed almost useless since he couldn't forget. He was 93. What was the point? 
So we were sitting in his study one afternoon. He was sitting in his expensive leather office chair. And as I began to speak pastorally about the power of forgiveness, the power of God to help heal us through forgiveness, the power of grace to heal wounds, especially wounds that we have carried for so long. God's power to heal our unforgiveness. He was leaning forward in his chair. He was listening very intently. And suddenly, to something that I said, he threw himself back in the chair and literally rolled back away from where he was sitting close to me. He said, what did you just say? And I said, I don't know. I don't remember. And I didn't. I couldn't remember exactly what it was that I said that it caused him to react to. So I had to kind of rewind the tape and I kind of went back to my memory where I could remember where I was talking. I started the conversation as I could remember it. And, and somewhere three or four minutes later, I ended up saying the same thing that I said the first time. And he goes, that's it. Say it again so I can write it down. And what I didn't remember saying, because sometimes it happens when the Holy Spirit leads me in conversations and, and I'll say things that I don't really form in my mind. It was that sentence that forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. Forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. That day, those were incredibly powerful words for, of healing for my friend. It was really the key for him that allowed him to start the work of forgiveness that finally, 90 years later, gave him the grace to begin to heal and begin to forgive what it was that had happened that he had never been able to forget. There's a little bit of a sidebar to that story. This gentleman who was kind of a Renaissance man all this time after he had retired had taken up writing, and he had written one script for a play written a script for a play, that he never expected to be performed. It was just a, a script for him as he had literally kind of worked out some of his own forgiveness and unforgiveness issues. This, success, this, this successful wealthy retired physician who had never been able to forgive had written a screenplay, essentially, about Peter, the disciple, who had denied Jesus three times and then who was forgiven three times by Jesus. The words that God gave me that day to give to him were added to the script of that play. They were words spoken to Peter by Jesus as the very last line of the play where he has Jesus looking at Peter and saying, forgiveness, Peter, is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. For Jesus and Peter knew that Peter would never be able to forget that Peter had denied Jesus those three times the night that Jesus was arrested. There's no way that Peter could ever forget that he had betrayed Jesus when Jesus needed him most. So my friend rewrote the ending to his play with Jesus telling Peter those words, Peter, forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. My friend died just a few years later, but before he died, our last conversation was about this play script. Some special friends had made arrangements with that local theater group to do a dramatic reading of this full play. There were no costumes, there were no stage sets. It was just actors sitting around a large table on the stage, each reading his or her part in a way that he or she would have acted that part out. So my friend at the end got to hear his full play read dramatically by trained stage actors. And he got to hear the actor portraying Jesus speak those words to Peter. Peter, forgiveness is how we live in peace with what we cannot forget. Now I suspect that he didn't achieve the full benefit of forgiveness before he died 90 years as a long time to carry that weight. But I know one thing for sure, my friend died in a much better place than he thought he ever would in his own lifetime because of the power of grace, even there at the end, to do remarkable work 
of healing. He may not have experienced the full benefit of forgiveness had he had more time, but he experienced enough forgiveness that it was life-changing for the rest of the life that he had. And that's important. It was life-changing for the rest of the life that he had. In his book called Forgiveness that I made mention that I'm referencing, Reverend Adam Hamilton offers a quote from a modern-day 20th century theologian, Paul Tillich, who wrote these words. He says, Forgiveness is an answer. Forgiveness is the divine answer to the question implied in our existence. The question is implied in our existence is what is the cost of my sin? Forgiveness, according to Tillich, is the divine answer to that. Psalm 32 that Nancy read gets at that. It tells us that. It reminds us that that divine that grace is the divine answer through forgiveness. Psalmist wrote these words, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Psalmist wrote that when I kept silent, as my friend did for 90 years, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer, carrying the weight of all of that unforgiveness. But then, the psalmist writes, but then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, Lord, I will confess my transgressions to you. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32 teaches us something remarkable there. And it's a remarkable little turn of a phrase of words that Psalm 32 says God that teaches us that God not only forgives and heals the sin, but God also forgave and healed the guilt of the sin. Forgave the sin, but forgave the guilt of the sin. Not just the sin, but the weight of the responsibility the weight of that deep, deep carrying over the years, the weight of the guilt of the sin. God forgives the the guilt, the sin, but He also forgives the, the guilt. Grace is the divine answer to all of our human brokenness. Grace, the divine answer. Grace forgives the sin, but grace also heals the guilt and the shame associated with the sin. Grace is the divine answer to sin. Grace is the divine answer to shame, and grace is the divine answer to guilt. Psalm 32 teaches us that when we ask God to forgive our sins, we must also ask God for forgiveness for having offended God in our sinning. Grace is the divine answer to us offending God. Forgiveness begins with that painful awareness, that realization that we are incapable of forgiving without God's grace. It's the power of God that allows us to forgive others. It's the power of God's grace that allows us to forgive ourselves. Grace, then, is the divine answer to unforgiveness. What is impossible to do in forgiving others becomes very possible through God's grace, giving us the power to forgive. Grace is the divine answer to unforgiveness. I'll share a story. It's a bit of a lengthy story, but it's worth hearing the entire story. And it's worth hearing the entire story in the words of the author who wrote the story. Some of you will recognize the name of the author, Corey Ten Boom. Corey is Dutch. She was a, uh, her family was a Dutch Reformed Christian, but during World War II, she and their family made it their mission to help save the lives of Jews who were trying to escape the horrors of Nazi Germany, but they were caught and sent to prison. Corey was sent to prison with her sister Bessie. They ended up in a Nazi death camp called Ravensbrück in Germany during World War II. It was there in that prisoner of war camp that Betsy died. Then several weeks after Bessie's death, by some clerical mistake, Corey was freed, somehow freed from the prison, returned home, Holland. And then one week later, every other woman that was in her group 
her age group at that death camp were gassed to death. Somehow, somehow, she escaped the inevitable death that was waiting for her. After the war, out of her faith, Corey became directly involved in the rehabilitation of the prisoners of the German army, German army, the moral injury that they had sustained in all that they had done to so many others. She began the harder work of reconciliation between the former captives, prisoners, and those who held them captive. Here's Corey's story in her own words. This event happened after a speech in Germany where she was relating her life as a prisoner of war and Bessie's death and the power of God to forgive. Her story is this, says, It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come to a defeated Germany from Holland with a message that God forgives. It was a truth, she said, that they needed to hear. It's the one that they most needed to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite picture, maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, but I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown, to the bottom of the sea. She said, when we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And that's when I saw him working his way forward through the others. One moment I saw him in his overcoat and his brown hat, but in the next I saw him as I remembered him in a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. He came back with a rush, that huge room at Robinsbrook with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in her home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And this man had been a guard at Robinsbrook concentration camp where we were sent. And now, now this man was standing in front of me, his hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein, how good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember me, one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him, and I remembered the leather crop swinging from his belt. And it was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood froze. You mentioned Robinsbrook in your talk. He was saying, I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he said, I have become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, the hand came out again. Will you, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I who since had every day had to be forgiven, and yet I could not forgive him. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking for forgiveness? It could not, could not have been many seconds that he stood there, his hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled doing the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do that. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Well, I knew it not only as a commandment of God, Bessie, uh, Corey writes, but I knew that as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for the victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and begin to rebuild their lives no matter what the physical scars were. 
This is important. She said, those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that, Corey writes. And still I stood there with a coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart, she says. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much, but you must supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, she says, I thrust my hand into the one that stretched out to mine. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. A current started running in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and it sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard, the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Going back to Corey's words, those who were able to forgive through the power of God's grace, those who were able to forgive their enemies were able to return to the outside world and to rebuild their lives no matter what their physical scars, no matter what their emotional scars were. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. I found the equivalent of all that Corey was writing about in a Facebook quote from a teen behavior expert by the name of Josh Ship. His quote reads simply, You either get bitter or you get better. It's that simple. You either take what has been dealt to you and you allow it to make you a better person or you allow it to tear you down. The choice does not belong to fate. It belongs to you. Get bitter or get better. Unforgiveness gets us bitterness that can be unresolved even to death. Get bitter or get better. Unforgiveness only gets you the bitter poison that kills you, not the person who you hold the unforgiveness toward. Unforgiveness gets you bitter. Only God's grace, the divine answer, gets you better. If the problem is unforgiveness, then grace is the divine answer to a worldly, a worldwide, but a very personal and individual problem. If unforgiveness, as I said last week, is like drinking a bitter poison, hoping that the other person dies, if unforgiveness is the bitter poison that you keep drinking, then know that God's grace is not just the divine answer, but it's the divine antidote to that bitter poison of unforgiveness that so many of us drink out of each and every day. Unforgiveness gets you bitter. God's grace, the divine answer, gets you better. Bitter or better. God leaves that choice to you. He leaves the choice to you But the miracles of grace are available to those who repent, those who reconcile through the power of grace, to take what was broken, to heal it, and to make it whole. Bitter or better, poison or grace, choice is yours. The power to heal is the Lord's. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank You and give thanks for all the ways in which You respond to God's grace through Your generosity and the kindness of Your Spirit that allows us to do things like providing meals for the football team. And I'm grateful for those of you who who remember the band nerds like me that weren't on the football team, that never got, got a meal. We weren't special enough. So I'm grateful that we're the kind of church that doesn't just feed the football players, but feeds the band too. 
it's important that they they are recognized for their hard work. Our church continues to do vital, active ministry. And we do that through all the things that you give. And for that, we give thanks. Daniel, before you start this, we sing this every time as a declaration of the blessings that we have received. I'm a, I want you to listen to these words. First, it says, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all my blessings flow. Praise Him, this creature sings below. Praise Him above, my heavenly boast. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's stand and sing the doxology. Thank you, Ed, for that good word. Please be seated. As we begin the liturgy for communion today, we begin, as we always do each and every communion Sunday, with the invitation. It's an invitation to all of you to come join us at the table of plenty. We extend that invitation in all the ways that we can to those that are joining us on Facebook or through the radio. The invitation reads this way. It says, Christ our Lord invites to His table all, A-L-L, all, everyone, all who seek or love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin." and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. That invitation is an invitation to repent, to seek to live in peace. That's the work of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the work of forgiveness. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And we will do our public confession together, and then we will pray in silence, which is our time for our private confession. And I would just ask you to give some mindfulness in some of your spirit to the thoughts of any unforgiveness that exists in your life that as we come to the table of plenty today, that the work of God's grace would begin to heal that unforgiveness in you and between you and others or between you and the Lord or between you and your own self. Let us join our voices together in our public confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done Your will. We have broken Your law. We have rebelled against Your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Hear now the good news. The good news of God's healing grace. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we are a forgiven people. Glory to God. Amen. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the living God. Holy God, in the beginning there was darkness, mystery, and You. But by Your own Word, You shattered the darkness with light. And that darkness that God shattered at the beginning, if that darkness lives in You as unforgiveness, that is a darkness that God can shatter and bring His light. He said in the sky, radiant beams of sunlight, and you punctured the night sky with sparkling jewels. You forever changed our darkness. Holy God, though there are shadows and worries, you have placed your word in us to be a lamp for our feet. You have given your spirit like a bright guiding star. You filled us with your love. As glorious as the sun, your place, you place your truth like a crescent moon. Every darkness is overcome with light, and every light contains shafts of your eternal light. God of the sun and stars, we praise you, and with all the creatures of earth and all the company of heaven, we join there and this unending hymn as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of Your glory. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Ever persistent and ever loving God, You placed a star in the sky to guide people from afar and near to Your child. Jesus became the light of the world, drawing the lost and the forgotten, the hurt and the wounded, the oppressed and the depressed to the wellsprings of life. You changed water into wine. You called unheralded workers to be disciples. You preached good news to the poor. You healed the sick and you beckoned people to love their neighbor. By His baptism, suffering and death and resurrection, He revealed to us you reveal to us the depths of your life, the poser of light. And you pose your light over darkness. On the night in which He gave Himself up for us, Jesus gathered together with His friends. He took the bread and He blessed it, giving thanks over it. And He broke the bread and said, this is My body broken for you. Every time that you eat of this bread, it's bread of life. This bread that can heal you through the power of grace. Do this in remembrance of Me. Later that night, took a cup and filled it with wine. He said, drink from this all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Given to you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each and every time that you drink of this cup, this cup of forgiveness, Every time you drink of this cup of forgiveness, do this and remember the works of grace that I can do in you. Therefore, holy God, grant that in praise and thanksgiving that we may be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in Your sight, and that our lives together may proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died 
Christ is risen and Christ will come again. So pour your Holy Spirit on us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that through Christ's presence that we may become a beacon of holy light, a source of joy and a witness for peace. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one with seekers far and near, one in ministry to all the world as we feast at the heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray that includes the words that we must forgive others in order for us to be forgiven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ and His grace. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing blood of Christ to heal and forgive. Nancy, would you come join me, please? Put your gloves on. You know, most times when we come for communion, we come and receive the cup and the bread, and then we go to kneel and pray. Maybe today is the day that we need to go and kneel and pray first. Maybe there's work of prayer and forgiveness that must be done could be done here in this holy place, this holy time. Maybe, maybe, for some of you, maybe coming to the altar first before you receive maybe what you need to do today. However, you need to do the meal. We invite you now. The table's been set. The invitation has been extended. The food is ready. Would you please come and join this meal of forgiveness of God's grace?
Would you join me now in prayer after communion? Let's join our voices together as we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourselves to us. Send us forth, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord of all. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer as our closing hymn. Please stand. Our Father, each art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you all for being here and for whatever it was that you brought to the Lord today. We pray that God's grace is beginning to do that work in you. I want to say special thanks for seeing Jake Poole today. Didn't expect to see you in church today. You had a little bit of a procedure this week. Uh, you were certainly had a preacher's excuse for staying home. You chose not to use it, so we're glad you're here. We're glad that all of you are here, those that are here in person, those who listen on Facebook or join us on the radio. God's grace extends beyond this church and this building. God's grace and His work of forgiveness extends beyond this building as well. But you can be instruments of that grace as you go forth this week to others and pray that you would have moments in which perhaps you are the one to extend a hand or maybe perhaps somebody will extend unexpectedly a hand of, unfor of forgiveness to you this week. We pray that you will respond in grace. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you, Beth. We have an opportunity to do that for a lady in Edmond who needs a new roof. We There is a project on the 18th of October we'll be beginning. If you are interested in helping, please let me know or call the church. Let's sing Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.